Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Heroes of the Harvest, which is the official podcast of Farmer Veteran Coalition. I'm your host, Diego, and joining me today is Bill Rogers. Bill is a military attorney with over 30 years of experience. He brings a unique perspective on the legal challenges faced by veterans who are considering or already have reinvested themselves as a farmer veteran. Bill served in the Air Force and Air National Guard before retiring as a colonel. He was awarded the Bronze Star after tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. He is also the owner of Double R Ranch and Farm, where he raises a multitude of different animals, such as sheep, goats, chickens, turkeys, bees, and horses. He joins us today to go over the various legal challenges that farm veterans face today and how to deal with them. Well, Bill, thank you for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Diego. Thanks a lot for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess we'll get right into it. Just um, why don't you tell me about yourself? Introduce yourself to our listeners. So. Uh, my background in, in farming and ranching, my interest really stemmed from my grandfather's on both sides. So my father's grandfather was a, a sharecropper in uh, Arkansas, which is a tough way to make a living. And then my mother's father, my uh, maternal grandfather, came over on the boat from Czechoslovakia, was a coal miner in Pennsylvania, built his own house and raised his own or, you know, built his own farm to raise his family and had 13 children. And so kind of skipped a generation with, with my parents' work, although my mom was always a gardener. But there was always a call for me to, to get back to the land. And, and really the, the power for me is I was looking for something when my military career ended that, that brought me peace and serenity and purpose. And, and I would encourage any veteran or anybody who's looking for those things to really consider farming because it does bring you just, just wonderful meaning and purpose. Uh, and it's just a release from everything else you do in life. It is definitely a common theme amongst our members how it is a slower um, lifestyle uh, as compared to their military life. And it's definitely helped a lot with their uh, mental state of mind as well as just finding a new purpose as well. Um, tell me about your military experience. So I uh, spent uh, just under 23 years uh, in the Air Force and the Air National Guard, like you indicated. I was deployed a bunch of times to the United Arab Emirates, to Iraq, Afghanistan, and really served in mentoring roles. And so it was very powerful to me to be able to work with my host nation counterparts on rule of law issues. That was significant. And then right before I retired, I was uh, activated a final time to uh, Air, then Air Force Space Command uh, to assist in the uh, stand-up of U.S. Space Command and ultimately Space Force. So uh, after that tour, I, I retired, but you, you weren't going to go out on a higher note. So I was had a, a blessed career, did everything I, I felt I could do to contribute to the safety of our nation and the betterment of our country. I'm uh, very proud of my military career. And um, so right after um, stepping out of the military, did you immediately get back to farming or how did that transition go? So we had bought a place. I, I live in Virginia in the, the Shenandoah Valley. And so when I came back on my mid tour, in 2009, I'll, uh, I'll fast forward, give you the Reader's Digest version, is uh, my wife and I bought a place in the Shenandoah Valley on top of Little North Mountain, where I'm sitting right now. Uh, beautiful view. Uh, we kept that place through the end of my military career and, and uh, my civilian life as well. So we knew when, when things were over, we wanted to settle back in Shenandoah County in the Shenandoah Valley. So uh, was up in Alaska. Uh, my last uh, duty assignment, I was in a guard capacity at that point. I had a civilian employer in Alaska, worked out a deal where I could telework from the Shenandoah Valley. And so that brought me back here. And and this is really uh, historically goes back to really the, uh, the bread belt of, if you go back to uh, 1862 to 1864, two campaigns in the Civil War that, that really relied on the Shenandoah Valley for the fertile ground, the crops, uh, all the livestock it produced to support both sides uh, during the fighting. And so there's been this tradition in the Shenandoah Valley of, of farming uh, rural area, about an hour and a half uh, west of Washington, D.C., uh, still rural enough, but but accessible enough if you really need to get somewhere. So that, that was really the start we got here. We looked around, started on a, a smaller operation, and then about three years ago, ended up buying the uh, the farm that, that I now uh, operate as the bar bar range and farm. And how is it um, operating the farm right now? 
So it, uh, it, it, let, let me take it just a step back real quick. So the first thing I told my wife, and uh, there's a special place in heaven with her because she stood by me for 38 years, but um, I, I told her the answer is no. So when people come up to you and go, hey, I've got a great idea. I can rehome. I have friends that need a place for the answer is no, because I wanted to start with sheep and cattle. But being the, the dutiful spouse, the dutiful husband, the two most important words in any happy, happy marriage are yes, dear. And so she said, hey, I've got a friend that's looking for a place for horses. We ended up with horses. Milk goats ended up with milk goats. Chickens ended up with chickens. That was never the plan. It was uh, sheep and cattle. So we we compromised. We ended up, uh, we still have the, uh, as you were saying, a bunch of other poultry now, turkeys, chickens, uh, ducks, guinea hens, kept the horses, kept the milk goats, and then added the sheep to it now. Do a little vegetable farming, but primarily livestock. And it's doing great. I, I worked uh, very closely with uh, Virginia State University. Their uh, lamb and sheep program uh, started off with, with uh, 10 sheep, and now I'm up to over 60. So the, the next... Uh, generation of sheep will be the ones that I, I begin to harvest. And and anybody considering this, if you're going to do livestock, do not name your animals because once you name your animals, you're never going to be able to eat them. Yeah, I've heard that before. So I also know that you're an attorney. So how did that start? Where did that begin? My passion in life and not trying to make myself anything more than, than what I am or who I am, but I always knew when I was young, I wanted to help people. And, and it was interesting. Uh, after I was practicing law, a, a friend from high school brought me a, a school newsletter and they had interviewed me. A news uh, editor had interviewed me after a football game and they said, hey, what do you want to do uh, in life? And this was my, my junior year. And, and I said at that point, I, I wanted to be an attorney because I wanted to be able to help people. So I knew from a young age, I, there was a vehicle for me to do that. And I ended up... Um, going to law school at night while working full time. Of course, I do everything backwards in life. And then I joined the military uh, as an attorney after that. I came in a little later in life, but felt that compelling desire to serve. So I uh, did six years of true active duty, went over on the guard side, but then got activated for Iraq, Afghanistan, United Arab Emirates, and, and ultimately Space Command. So was a, a JAG, uh, a Judge Advocate General, for those of you not familiar with it, a prosecutor, defense counsel, and a military judge, as well as a, a supervisory staff judge advocate. So I, I basically covered uh, or checked all the boxes that, that you can in a military JAG group. I can definitely relate a lot to um, wanting to help people because it reminds me of back when I was in high school too. Um, just that people asked me too, what do I want to do? And again, I just want to help people, which is what brought me to this, working for this nonprofit. Um, it's funny because I don't have any experience in farming um, and I have no veteran experience in any of my family. I do have friends who are veterans, but what really matters to me is just helping people and making a difference. And I've been able to do that here at FEC. So I, do, I can definitely relate to. And, and I think the key is well. service. And that's that's really where the, the, the farming piece and for me, the attorney piece comes in. And the farming is such a relief. You know, I get up early, take care of the animals. And it, it's really so cathartic for me. You know, and it, it just is a peaceful time for me, learning their personalities, interacting with them, taking care of them. There's there's hardship too. You know, I, I lost a couple of lambs this oh, yeah. week just with the the weather we're having on the East Coast. Nothing I could do to to save them. And it it you know, if you care about your animals, it's it's tough to deal with. But all when you see them grow and develop, or especially in the springtime when they're jumping and kicking, and you know, I, I mean, and and when they come up to you, when they respond to you, and they start to trust you. It, it ties into most, you know, so many themes that uh, we experienced in the military, you know, the, the service for things other than yourself, you know, the camaraderie, although it's with four legged things, not two legged things, but, but all those things really tie together. And it's, I, you know, it, it, it's a powerful experience. And, and I strongly encourage anybody who's considering it, you know, get into it. Even if you're going to dip your toe in the water, do it. Don't, don't say, oh, I'm going to get to it at some point because you'll miss part of life. It's a mind blowing experience for someone who like like me who doesn't really who didn't really think about agriculture much and kind of I'll be honest kind of took it for granted. It's just great to hear all the stories that we get from um, our members, the fellowship fund awardees, all that. It's just, it's great to just be able to share those. You know, people will ask me, "Is is farming hard work?" And uh, I I don't see it as hard work, but it's committed and it's long work. And and again, it's you know yeah. something that that. For anybody with a military career is is used to that part of it. 
but you know, if you're not afraid of getting dirty, of being around stinky stuff all the time, because animals or even, you know, fertilizer gives you that, uh, you don't mind sweating a little bit. Uh, you know, that, that part of it is just, it's really remarkable. But, it, but again, there's so many parallels to military career. People are looking for that transition or just something to, to help them find that sense of peace. Definitely farming, ranching is, is for that. Yep. And I think that's a good segue for our next um, part of the podcast is, since becoming an attorney, as you want to help um, other farmers, what are some issues that you've seen a lot? Any legal issues? How did, what do a lot of farmers reach out to you for? So the, the big thing for me, and, and I know we talked a little bit in advance of, of this, is my whole position on this is really risk. Uh, and, and again, mm-hmm. military operations, you're working on your con ops, whatever it might be. You always have the, you know, the operational risk management, the ORM pieces. You know, what, what risk are we willing to accept? And I think that's a big part of farming that new farmers or even experienced farmers overlook. So to, to me, going into it, you have to be smart and, and it doesn't mean you have to be, you know, brilliant smart. You just got to be smart about what you do and you got to think about what you're doing in advance. The old adage is, uh, what, you know, failing to plan is planning to fail. It, you know, so you got to know what you're getting into. And I would say the first thing is you, you got to decide what you have a passion for because so many people spend their entire lives becoming something they don't want to be. So if, if you get into a part of farming, you're like, Hey, I'm going to do this. And you, you, find, uh, pick something that's, you know, cheap barrier to entry, but you hate it, you're not going to stay with it very long. So you have to find something that's passionate to you. And then I took a bunch of, you know, the USDA has a great relationship with the VA and, and there's a, a, just a ton of courses out there and programs that you can take at, at no cost. I took a course, a long course with NC State and with Virginia State, with Mount Olive University, veteran farmer centric courses. Uh, and they would start off and they would say, determine your market first. And because I'm an attorney and I know everything, right? That's sarcasm and, and a joke. But, um, you know, I'm like, ah, come on. You know, it, it's like field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. If, if you raise it, you will sell. And, and that's not the case. And, and I would say, find that passion. Again, this all goes to risk because it's going to mitigate the risk of you ending up with a bunch of vegetables you can't sell or a bunch of animals you can't sell or do anything with. Find that passion of what you want to do, throw yourself into it, but very early on, determine your market. Where are you and who are you going to sell to? And and then build your business plan around that. And, you know, three levels of risk. I, I you know, explained to everyone and farmers in particular, risk you're willing to accept risk you mitigate, and then risk you outsource. So those are really the three. And the ones you're willing to accept, you know, you might accept, like we're experiencing on the East Coast this year, the risk of drought. You know, you you put your money, your assets, your time into vegetables, into livestock, nothing you're going to do to make it rain. So, you know, planning for water shortages or planning water, that's a risk element that you're willing to take on you know, mitigate, like all the courses I talked about, like, you know, Farmer Veteran Coalition, taking the courses that are available there through the colleges and university. Every state has an extension program, puts on all sorts of courses for free, reach out to veterans. You know, I'm an attorney, so what I have in my office, I've got an office full of books, right? You want want me to tell you how many I've read? You know, they're all sorts of farming books, cattle, sheep, vegetables, whatever it might be. Don't do that. Don't make my mistake. You can go online, get all the resources for free, take the courses, Google, get all that information, make yourself super smart, and you're going to be able to mitigate that risk. So that's, you know, the mitigation piece. And then the final piece is outsourcing. And and that's typically insurance. You know, do, do you want to have an attorney on retainer? I'm not trying to take food off an attorney's table. Probably not. Do you want to have an attorney that you know that you can reach out to if things get really bad? Absolutely. But the mitigate or the uh, outsourcing piece to me when it comes to farming is that insurance piece is you want to have a really good uh, relationship with your local insurance carrier, or broker, or agent, whatever it might be, specifically related to farming issues. You know, so it can be general liability, it can be contamination, it can be crop loss. You know, you want to make sure you have that done in advance. So those are really the three levels I'd, I'd encourage people to consider when they're getting into. Uh, farming, or even if they've been in farming for a while and, and 
they really haven't thought about those things. But to the degree you can manage risk in advance, however you decide to do it, you know, is going to be key to your success. Okay. And so let's say I'm an Army veteran and um, I'm getting into farming and I decide I want to be a fisherman. I want to sell fish to, to a, a, my local farmer's market or something like that. What are some risks that I should be able to look out for? So you've got fish, seafood, shellfish. Let's group it all together. Let's let's just call it seafood, okay? Let's just call it seafood, even if it's yeah. inland and people say, hey, attorney, guess what? You call it, okay. We're going to call it seafood for our purposes. Um, so <laughs> it, it depends on whether you're going to catch it or whether you're going to raise it. And, and every state's a little different. So um, as I mentioned early on, I'm in Virginia. So I'll, I'll talk about Virginia. Uh, generally, but I mean, uh, you, yeah. you can look at any state or, or at the end of this, I'm, I'm more than happy to provide my email address. People are welcome to uh, email me. Uh, I can't necessarily give them legal advice, but I can point them in the right direction, which is fine. Uh, but, but in Virginia, so you're going to need, if you're going out and catching fish to sell, you're going to need a commercial fisherman's license. And typically your state, it's either, you know, game and wildlife, fisheries, uh, whatever it might be, is is going to regulate commercial licenses. But you're also going to have the either your Department of Agriculture and or the Department of Health within the state, which regulates seafood. And and I, I would say seafood of all farming activities can, can be, if you're new to it, I, and I'm not saying don't do it, and this is where I'm saying get smart and think it through in advance and come up with that plan in advance so you can mitigate that risk is it's like a ham and egg breakfast. So the the chicken is involved, the pig is committed. It, when it comes to seafood, if you're going to do it as a, a profession, you've got to be committed because there's so many licensing and permitting requirements. Probably the best analogy is a, a driver's license, right? Gives you the, the ability or the, the permission to drive or you get a learner's permit. So what you're going to see with permits is typically those are issued where there's a high degree of safety, maybe issued by the state, or if you get into county. So farmer's market for issue, uh, for instance, you're going to need your commercial fishing license if you're going to go out and catch fish, harvest oysters, whatever it might be. But you're likely going to need a permit for the farmer's market. And then depending on how you sell the seafood, you, you may need subsequent permits or endorsements. And again, that's going to come from your state department of agriculture, uh, your state health department, or um, in Virginia, there's a third entity which regulates uh, uh, shellfish, which is uh, the marine entity. Uh, and they regulate all the, the marine fisheries that go on either inland or offshore. So it, it, the licensing permitting pro, uh, part of it, you got to get that right because there's going to be all sorts of rules and regulations which go along on what temperature you have to hold the seafood at. Nobody needs to be an expert on this. I'm just pointing out there's very specific requirements when it comes to handling that seafood. Uh, because the, ri the risk on seafood, as we all know, you get bad seafood, you get a bad oyster, you get a bad piece of fish. You know, ba bad things can happen to people right away. Yeah. So for, um, I know Virginia, if you're trying to sell seafood, like with, with the in-state or out-state, because you're pretty close by to other states, how does that work? How, is that, again, tied to like licensing and certification and all that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and, a, and I'm glad you kind of gave me a heads up in advance, because what I wanted to do is I live on the border of West Virginia, and a lot of people you know live in border yeah. states, so it's really easy to say, okay, look, I've, I've got my my seafood business operating. I'm doing great. Hey, I'm just going to drive you know 10 miles across the state line. I'm going to sell it there. So let me, I'm not going to read it all to you, but I actually pulled West Virginia's statute because again, it's, it's, you know, 10 minutes away from me, but they yeah. require um, a special permit to transport all fish in the state. So you can't take, you know, a couple shrimp, a couple crabs, whatever it is. So any fish that comes from Virginia to West Virginia, and this is going to be consistent with every state on the country. So I'm not trying to make people experts on West Virginia law. And, and on that permit, you have to list all the species. So you can't just get a general fish permit. You have to list all the species that you're going to uh, bring in. The date you're going to transport uh, the, the seafood into West Virginia, 
and each permit is only valid for one trip. Now, there may be some, uh, some states have um, interstate compacts or reciprocity agreements where you may be able to do that over a period of time. But again, just don't make the assumption, hey, because I'm close to the state line, nobody's looking, because this is definitely an area you can get into a lot of trouble with. Um, and, uh, you know, West Virginia also gets very, very specific about things like trout and salmon. And you, again, not trying to make people experts, I just want to emphasize the point of how specific this can get as it relates to uh, uh, seafood. So you, you have to get a statement mm -hmm. issued by a recognized fish pathologist. I never knew there was such a thing as a fish pathologist, but there is. Uh, to certifying the, uh, the fish to be free of whirling disease, infectious pancreatic necrosis, viral hemorrhagic, uh, septicemia, and other diseases which may threaten fish stocks. So the, the point of that is, you know, kind of the, the foot stomp as, as we would go back to our military time is you, you really have to be very specific about what you're doing, even more so when, when you're thinking about crossing the state. With seafood, I feel like it, it might be a bit more complicated because I know there's a lot of health issues that you got to look into whenever handling seafood, like um, like for food safety. Um, what do you, what does one need to look out for? So you're, if you're going to be a food handler and if if and you or, or our audience is going to handle food, you're, you're going to eventually have to get a, uh, a you know food handler safety certification. And I went through the process not too long ago. I, I took a, an eight-hour course. I was like, ah, I'm an attorney. Like I said, I, I know everything. I took this course, and I mean, it it kicked my rear end. I mean, the specificity of it, it, it was great because not not having really got into the weeds of food handling before, uh, I, I mean, it really opened my eyes about, you know, the uh, preparation, you know, the the storage of not, you know, storing raw seafood versus cooked seafood in the same location, you know, really having separation. Um, when you display, uh, if you go to a farmer's market, for instance, and you have seafood for sale, um, the temperature you have to maintain it at, but also the contaminants that can come from ice, if you just let the ice drain down, uh, you know, and melt off, how, how that can uh, compromise your seafood and contaminate the seafood and obviously cause problems. So I, I would encourage anybody again, early on, if they're thinking about being in the seafood handling or, or for that matter, any of the, the food handling business, go ahead, get that certification. Again, you can do, I, I've had friends that have done courses through the community college, their local community college, which is typically a two week course, an online course, but I'm telling you, don't think you're going to be able, and again, one of our military terms, clep it, you know, be able to go in there and just walk away because it is very, very specific, but it's some great information. And then from your experience on your farm, what have you had to go through regarding any legal issues, any licensing stuff? What have you had to deal with? So, uh, so far I've been very fortunate um, and there hasn't been a lot of challenges. I will tell you, uh, one of the things, if if people were doing agritourism, and you said, well, how does that really? So uh, if we have a moment, I want to come back to Bioflock, which is something I'm fascinated about right now. But if you were to do agritourism, people actually come on your farm, you know, to see your seafood, your livestock, whatever operation you have going on. Virginia's got a great statute, uh, which, which uh, if you post a sign, and in the Virginia statute, it's very specific as people engaged in the normal and ordinary uh, business of agritourism, there, there's no liability for the owner. Now, I'm oversimplifying, and I would encourage everybody to pull Virginia statute and any of their state statutes that are, that are comparable to that. But the, the whole idea is, hey, there's risk that goes on in a farm. You, you, you go out with cattle, guess what? You know, and, and uh, one of the courses uh, I, I took early on, a, a veteran talked about cattle and he great line. He said, everybody wants to be a cattle farmer until they get kicked in the chest the first time. Cattle are going to do that. Yeah. You know, horses are going to kick you. Uh, I've, I've got my, my, uh, my goats. Some of them have horns, great personalities, but every now and then they get wound up and they'll want to like, you know, give me a little poke with the horn or something. That's going to happen if you people, you know, have people come on your property. If, uh, uh, you know, you've got bird influenza, not that I've ever had that, but you know, your, your poultry gets sick and somebody contracts that, 
you know, that's an issue you have to anticipate, you know, in advance. But the, the agritourism piece is really, especially if you're around a metropolitan area, some people have never experienced a farm. Like you were saying, your background, you don't, you don't really get exposed to farming uh, or farms until, you know, later on in life. It, it's incredible how you can really um, educate people the the farm to table push now the transparency of farming yeah. you know people want to know where their sea their not just seafood but all their food is coming from so to be able to provide that to people to experience your farm and then to you know have value added products you know people love grabbing the you know the t shirt that they've been out to the farm getting the photo ops taking the wagon rides I mean there's really a core business you can you can uh, build around that and uh, just a Sandra Day O'Connor um, you know, one of the former Supreme Court justices had a had a great line. She said, do good while you're doing well. And, you know, you can you can build a business uh, around agritourism or your farm, but also reach out to the community to, to help them understand the significance of farmers and what they contribute to our society and our, and our future and the well-being of, you know, our families and, and our children. Yeah. And I'm glad you touched on that because agritourism is definitely something that's growing in popularity, especially amongst our membership, because we get more people who, like you said, want to visit the farm. They want to know where their food's coming from. They want to learn more about agriculture and maybe try to get into it themselves, whether it's a small garden in their backyard to actually buying a plot of land. And I can relate. The only the only thing I can really relate to agriculture is um, almost getting kicked in the face by a horse because um, Back when I was in high school, yeah. I used to work at an equine that, clinic. Um, that, that, that's all it takes. You, you you've used the uh, you know the the perfect example to make my point is that that stuff's going to happen. You know, and it doesn't matter how yeah. you know tame uh, they are. Is something something can set them off, and you know strangers or different things. But but to give people the experience to come out and see nature and, and see livestock or to see you know crops growing. It, it, that in and of itself is a really cathartic experience for people. So don't, don't overlook, I, I would encourage our audience, don't overlook the agritourism piece of, um, you know, what you can make available to the, the public that may have never experienced it. And, and the, the bioflock piece real quick, if I may. So yeah. you know, when it comes to seafood, you can either have an open system or a closed system. And so an open system is typically if you have like a fish cage or an oyster bed, where the water's replenished naturally. So you have tides that move water in and out of your cages or your oyster beds, or you can have a closed system. And closed systems have been developed not too long ago, but but one of the things that I'm exploring, and I, I've done the research, I, I haven't embarked on it yet, but is, is bioflock, and that's uh, raising sh- shrimp inland. And so not an incredibly novel idea, but uh, the, the concept is, is you can have tanks you know, it's it's a form of aquaculture, but you know, have tanks with your shrimp in it, and and the key to bioflock is adding molasses. Apparently, just makes the shrimp thrive. And so, if you're in an area, whether it's the Midwest or away from uh, the coastal areas, and and are thinking about, hey, you know what, I I love seafood or I love uh, fresh shrimp, or I've got this whole entire restaurant community that doesn't have access to fresh seafood. I would encourage anybody to really explore the the bioflock concept because it it's not cost intensive. Um, the the market is out there. Uh, you just really need to think it through. And I that that's the next phase. It's probably about a year away for me before I get into that. So, what about any? Um, I know as time passes, it's become more of a. It can be controversial at times, but also it's becoming more important, like climate. Um, regulations and stuff like that was some things that you know a farmer may have to look out for, especially in seafood or any other um, industry. So, it's, seafood in particular, uh, we mentioned the the drought on the eastern seaboard. I know a lot of the countries experienced that. I, I saw the weather reports this morning in the Upper Midwest, where you know I think all week it was supposed to be well into the you know triple digits with the heat index, you know, and 110 and, and above. Um, you know, that's really where crop insurance is going to come in and where I encourage yeah. people to, if, if you're going to, if you're going to invest, you know, other than if you're putting out, you know, putting out some corn and tomato plants for, for your own consumption, or maybe a farmer's market, if you're going to invest the time, you really got to look at that insurance piece. 
Um, the, the other part of it is uh, when it comes to the shellfish market. So Virginia has designated shellfish areas and, and you can get licenses or permits, you know, essentially to harvest a particular area um, be, because of the heat. Um, it's, it's just um, the, the habitat isn't there to produce healthy shellfish. And so there's a lot of contaminants in the water now. There's a lot of algae blooms. Uh, so if you harvest that, you know, the shellfish and you eat them, obviously bad things are going to happen. And so with the heat, you know, comes that downside as well. And, and for uh, livestock, like I said, for me, you know, keeping fresh water, you know, out in the pastures has been a challenge. Making sure the animals have adequate shade, you know, has been a challenge. And I'm fortunate that I'm able to move them a little bit. But, um, you know, if, if you can't do that, you really got to think it through. Because not only is it the humane thing to do, but the maltreatment of animals, not only are they going to be unhealthy and you're not going to be able to sell lower quality, you know, meat or seafood or whatever it might be, but, but you're going to get yourself in trouble with regulatory authorities or somebody's going to come by and go, man, those animals look really bad. You know, that's, that's, and there's a reason for that because, you know, we're, we want to be responsible, you know, farmers and ranchers and, and take care of, you know, what we're fortunate to have and raise, but there's a, a certain way you're going to do it. You know, there's a great line from, from the movie, The Patriot with Mel Gibson, you know, when he's training his sons and he says, aim small, miss small. And, and I would encourage people again, you know, I'm, I'm the type of guy that's like, I can do it all. So let's do everything from day one. Uh, I get kind of excited and wound up, but I try and calm down. Uh, yeah. but, but the key to that to me is, you know, start with one or a couple of things and do them really, really well and then expand from there because you're not going to get discouraged. You know, or if something goes wrong, you know, when we talk about risk mitigation, the hit isn't going to be too tremendous on you. You know, you, you spend everything you have or you invest a bunch of things and you find out, especially if you have a day job and, and more and more farmers. And I find with veterans is they've got a day job and then they try and pick up farming on the side, which is what I do. I, I'm still practicing attorney during the day. Uh, so, I, you, you know, it can get challenging making sure I put in, you know, the time necessary for my day job and then getting up early and staying late. But it, it's a passion for me. So it's not it's not a chore. There's no resentment on my part because, again, it's that, that piece of the the relief or the piece of uh, calmness for me. Oh, yeah. If you love what to do, it's never, it's never work. Yeah. Labor love. There you go. Um, let's see. Anything else you'd like to say or like? Or what's a good starting point for someone to um, look into for risk mitigation, insurance, all that stuff? So I, I would say just if you go through that analysis that I said before, the three-part analysis yeah. of just, just objectively look at stuff and, and don't, don't um, uh, you know, foul it off down the left field of the line. No, that's not important. That's not important. You know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to discourage anybody because all this is doable and the payoff at the end of the day is extraordinary. But, but go through that, look at something and say, hey, is, is this, if there's a downside to this, is this a risk I'm willing to accept? Is it a risk I'm willing to mitigate? Or is it a risk I'm willing to outsource? And, and also on the outsourcing piece, you know, think about, you know, the cost of insurance, because you're, you're going to have certain products or lines of farming that you embark on that are going to have more risk than others. And, and with that, you know, an insurance agent is going to uh, charge a higher premium. I mean, that, that's what risk yeah. and what insurance is all about. Through the extension program in, uh, in every state and, and the extension program are a combination of the land grant universities, uh, typically in each state. There's just, I mean, I, I can't tell you how much incredible information is out there for free. You know, so, so go with uh, Dr. Google. Uh, and, you know, farming risk, uh, Google those two things, and, and you're going to get just a ton of articles that are going to help you think through the process. So I encourage that. And then I'm, I'm more than happy. Like I said, if, if there's people that are starting out or want to bounce ideas off me, uh, you're, you're welcome to email me at uh, agjagfarming at gmail.com. So an homage to agriculture, ag, jag from a judge advocate general, my military career farming so agjag farming at gmail.com I'm, I'm more than happy to to give you a, you know my cut about hey this is a resource you can tap into 
or this is may you know this may be something you want to consider uh you know embarking on or you know talking with an insurance agent about whatever it might be but i'm, I'm more than happy to make that available to our veteran community all right and to send off i will be in maryland next week and i heard seafood's good up there is that true? Any anything you recommend while uh, I'm up there? The, the Maryland seafood, Virginia uh, touts itself as I think the uh, third biggest uh, seafood producing state. I did not see where Maryland at, but you got to get Maryland blue, blue crabs. I mean, absolutely get the blue, yeah. blue crabs, and you got to get Old Bay seasoning on them. Uh, you can you can go old school and do the crab cakes that are prepared for you, but but take the time to crack mm-hmm. your own crabs. Yeah, crabs was the first thing that came to mind. There, there I'll be go. in Annapolis, so I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, no, I'll see no what better I can place find up there. No, no better place for uh, for seafood. So enjoy yourself. You'll have a great time, and you'll get some wonderful seafood. <laughs> I will. I'm looking forward to it. Anything else you'd like to say before we end off? I just appreciate the time, and I encourage all our veterans that are considering getting into farming and ranching do it. it it'll really give you a purpose and meaning to your life. And with that, we have completed our fourth episode of Heroes of the Harvest. Thank you to Bill, who provided valuable insight on how to mitigate risk on your farming operation. Like Bill said during the interview, always ask yourself, what risk are we willing to accept? Is it a risk I can deal with myself, or should I outsource it? What about the cost of insurance? Always ask yourself these questions and stay up to date on any rules and regulations pertaining to your state. For those wanting to learn more, I recommend reaching out to Bill via his email, agjagfarming at gmail.com. He's always willing to hear about what you're dealing with on your farm or if you need any advice on how to start out. As always, thank you to our supporters as we continue to grow this podcast. Please share this with anyone who you think will be interested. You can find us on Spotify by looking up Heroes of the Harvest and on YouTube by searching Farmer Veteran Coalition. Thank you again for listening and see you next time.